personnel. We've got engine start and we're into the bus count. One personnel, please continue to monitor your system and grasp is in control. Welcome to the post-test briefing for the hot fire test of the core stage for NASA's Space Launch System rocket. The hot fire is the eighth and final test of the Green Run test series, a comprehensive assessment of the rocket's core stage prior to launching Artemis missions to the moon. During the test that took place today here at NASA's Stennis Space Center near Bay St. Louis in Mississippi, engineers loaded more than 700,000 gallons of cryogenic or super cold propellant into the tanks and fired all four engines at the same time for a little over eight minutes to simulate launch. Here to talk with us about the hot fire test are NASA Acting Administrator Steve Jerzyk, Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters, John Honeycutt, SLS Program Manager from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and Julie Bassler from SLS Stages Manager from Marshall. Also joining us on the phone for the Q&A session, we'll have Maury Vander, Chief of Test Operations at Stennis, Johnny Heflin, SLS Liquid Engines Manager from Marshall, John Shannon, Vice President and SLS Program Manager of Boeing, and Doug Bradley, Deputy RS-25 Program Manager at Aerojet Rocketdyne. Our speakers will each give a few opening remarks from the speakers here on the stage, and then we'll take questions from reporters on the phone. For the reporters on the line, you can enter star one at any time to be joined into the queue. Your phones are on mute now and the operator will open your mic for, to ask your question and close your mic when you're done. First, we'll hear from NASA Acting Administrator, Steve Jerzyk. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, so first, what a great day and a great test. And right up front, I just wanna say how proud I am of this team. Um, many of the team members have been on the program for a lot of years and, uh, and have worked really hard to get to this point, um, including the past year uh, during all the challenges we've had with the global pandemic. And I uh, just could not be more proud of the team, of their talent, dedication, getting to this point and pulling off a just very successful test. Um, it's been a really actually great year for NASA during a very challenging year for the nation and the world. Um, we had the first launch of astronauts from uh, American soil in almost 10 years with the DEMO-2 launch. Uh, we followed that up with the uh, Earth Science mission, the Mike Freilich, Sentinel-6 Mike Freilich launch, and then the Crew-1 launch, our second crew launch to the International Space Station, and then in February, the Perseverance landing, and now uh, the Green Run test. And so I am, I am so grateful and proud for the NASA team, our industry partners, our academic partners, and our international partners that work together in, to pull off these amazing accomplishments. And I just, again, I'm, I am proud and humbled to be um, a leader of this organization. Um, so what does this mean for our plans? Well, this is a major milestone advancing our goals and objectives for Artemis um, to land um, the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon and to return to the moon, this time to stay, to explore the moon sustainably, demonstrate the capabilities and technologies that we need to eventually achieve a human mission to Mars. So not only critical for our Artemis plans, but critical for our overall moon to Mars plan and achieving that ultimate goal. And, um, and this test will allow us to continue the integration of the Space Launch System, the largest, most powerful rocket ever developed, which we're gonna integrate with the Orion spacecraft and do an uncrewed test flight, um, leading to a crew test flight and then that first landing mission on the moon. And the SLS and Orion, along with the Gateway and the Human Landing System, the first human rated landing system in development since Apollo, are the backbone of the systems and the architecture that we're going to need to accomplish those, these goals and objectives of a permanent and sustained presence around and on the moon. Um, so this is a major step in, in advancing our, our goals. And again, um, couldn't be more proud of the team. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I, I just um, 
almost speechless about how well things went today. So uh, thank you very much. All right, we'll go to Tom next. Okay, and I agree with Steve's comments. This has just been a tremendous day. Uh, congratulations, John and Julie. Your teams, the other team is represented here today, and everybody that worked all those years before today to actually have a design, a manufacturing facility, everything that goes behind a rocket. It's very uh, amazing accomplishment. This was the last really big development test we needed to complete, get behind us. And in our program, we take it a step at a time. This was a really important step for us. Uh, John and Julie will talk about the next steps in terms of reviewing the data and seeing what we got out of the test. Generally speaking, it's going to take about a month to complete refurbishment. Then we will ship it down to the Cape. Uh, it goes down the Pearl River, through the Gulf, down the tip of Florida, and into Cocoa Beach. And we did it into the Turn Basin. And for those folks that are familiar with the VAB, we actually go into the VAB. And we go to the right at the very end, that's High Bay 3, and we're going to put it right in the stack. We've got the boosters ready to go on the ML. We've got processing going on Orion. And I just can't agree with Steve Moore. A lot of us are going to look back at this day later in our careers and our lives, talk to our families and friends and significant others and say we were here for a very important test for the most powerful rocket ever built. And I think that's just an incredible accomplishment. Uh, for terms of what happens after this, once we get to the Cape, we'll take it a step at a time. We have a lot of very specific activities that will occur next, a lot of stacking operations, integration operations, test and checkout. And when we accomplish those operations, we'll be ready to fly. And just as we've done today, we'd like to take that a step at a time. We'll see how we do later on in the year. We have, uh, we're very excited about that, and it's going to be very visible. We're going to bring everybody along to kind of follow us as we go through the year, and we're very excited about that. So I'm going to turn it over to John. Congratulations, John. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, it was very exciting to see uh, the test today. You know, this was the culmination of uh, a series of tests, and I just couldn't be more excited and proud of the team. You know, it's it's been uh, several years since I uh, experienced the uh, the vibration and the sense of the power and the, and the feeling of, of of a rocket like this, and it uh, it literally just gives me cold chills whenever I get to experience that. And I think it's I think what it does for for the team it it's it's really a, uh, it's, it's the fruits of their hard work, and um, that's that's extremely important, and that's what keeps driving this team. Uh, we, we've had some challenges with this green run, and uh, I'm just so proud of the team with the way they've methodically worked through these challenges, and th just the the work the work that they've done got us to where we are today and got us to a really good test. Um, all the data that we <clears throat> have looked at so far, and we've got a lot more to look at, but everything that we've seen in the test today looked nominal uh, so I would I would say uh, the core stage uh, Julie got a, got an A plus today <clears throat> um, and so uh, I can't I can't go without thanking Julie and the stages team uh, all the folks in the SLS program uh, our prime contractors uh, Boeing and Rocketdyne and especially our friends at Stennis that uh, provided a great test facility and a great test operations team. Uh, I got to see this team work through uh, these series of tests, and, and the more they tested, the better they got. And that was really evidence today uh, with a good, a good smooth uh, countdown to get us into the test. Uh, I would also just like to to take a, just one second of time to mention the fact that we did we did lose one of our teammates this this week and it was Mike Rudolphy. Uh, he's one of our forefathers at, at, that worked in the program with us, and uh, he will be dearly missed. And uh, we owe him a debt of gratitude for his contributions to get us to where we got to today. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting on the test stand and uh, assessing the core stage over the next few days. 
uh, and taking a look at what kind of work we need to do on the stage to get it ready to ship. And then uh, at that point in time, we'll remove it from the stand, get it on the barge, and ship it to KSC. And we're really looking forward to that. So in SLS, we've got all our hardware at KSC, and we've got both boosters stacked, and we're really excited to uh, be able to get the core stage to KSC and get it stacked in between those two boosters. So, Julie, I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, so yes, it's been a, an extraordinary day. Um, so a, a lot of hard work has gone into uh, getting us to this point today. Um, the team is amazing. Every time we test, we learn something new, and they are so resilient. And, and uh, the team that pulled together today, the Boeing and Rocketdyne and the Stennis and the SLS team, um, we have met several challenges this year, uh, not to mention the COVID, but also with all the weather challenges we had. We actually had a weather challenge last night, actually. Um, so it, it, uh, we were watching uh, the, the bad storms come through, um, but we had a Stennis team that was on the ready and they came out around 2 a.m. and got on the facility and finished up all of our pre-test work that we needed to do out on the stand. So at 5.30 when the test team came in, uh, they, we had a, a all clear sign and we were ready to go into test. At uh, 6 a.m. this morning, we did our tanking, go, no, go. And, uh, and we had no anomalies, no issues were being worked. Um, so, and that was pretty much the way the whole day went. Uh, we went through the whole day. Uh, we had no significant on anomalies. It was the smoothest test. I think that uh, uh, for sure we've ever ran and several other people on the team said any test they've been part of. I mean, we had no major issues and we went all the way up to the team T minus 10 minutes and we did our hold and checked everything and uh, did the final uh, go, no go from the test team and uh, went right into the hot fire. So uh, I think you can see from the video and and, uh, and, uh, and everything that uh, all the data we're seeing now, as Mr. Honeycutt said, uh, everything looks like we were right down the middle of our modeling and our analysis. Um, we have met all of our objectives now. So, uh, you know, we talked about we needed at least four minutes. Well, we did twice as good as we needed. So, uh, so uh, big thanks to the team and uh, what couldn't be more proud and uh, more humbled be, to be part of such a fantastic team. Uh, there was never a point where somebody said, that's not my job. It was all about what do we got to do to get this hot fire off today. So uh, great effort and I uh, wanted to just thank everybody. Thank you. We'll now take questions from reporters on the line. Uh, please press star one to be entered into the queue. We ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be joined into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two to remove, be removed from the queue. All right, so for our first question, we'll take Marsha Dunn from Associated Press. Um, a question for Mr. Jersick. I'm, I'm wondering um, what kind of schedule you think uh, you have for this year. Do you think you can launch the first flight by year's end, or do you think it'll bump into 2022? And what about the first moon landing? When do you think that might actually take place? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take the moon landing part, and I'm going to kick the, the, the launch part to Tom Whitmire. Okay. Yeah. So on the on the moon landing part, we um, so we are have a internal study that we're conducting right now to look at um, the missions beyond Artemis II, um, and particularly given the appropriations that we got in FY21. Um, actually, it was really good appropriations in 21, including a, a good bit a good bit of funding for the human landing system, but not what we requested. And uh, so it's probably take a few months to get through that study. We'll take a look at um, what we can optimally do given the FY21 budgets and expected budgets in out years and, uh, and lay out the mission manifesting cadence beyond the Artemis II mission. So we have some work to do there, but we're in the middle of that work right now. Okay, let me talk about the launch situation. And it's kind of what I've described uh, at the start of the process. You know, we take this a step at a time. Uh, we saw that here today. I mean, our goal is to get through uh, certain tests and certain activities, and when we're done with that, we have an opportunity to fly. And so I'm always very careful. I used to do shuttle program, and we're always very careful to say we need to get through every one of these tasks, every one of these activities. They're highly visible events. You'll be able to follow the hardware as it comes from here. 
travels down to the Cape, is integrated in the Cape. Uh, we're already processing Ryan. We're, we're loading Ryan with fuel. We already uh, have the booster stack ready to go. And so the real answer to your question is when we complete those tasks, then we'll be in a position to fly. Now, like we saw here at Stennis, these tests were really important. We did learn some new things as we went through that. I think it was a, a tremendous accomplishment as, you, as if, if for the first time flight of a world's most you know, powerful vehicle. We, we, we really learned some important things. And so I expect we'll learn some important things when we get down to Florida. It'll be the first time we've used the facilities in Florida. Uh, we may come across a few things that we need to address. So I think the real answer to your question is that, you know, we're looking for opportunities this year. But the real answer is we will absolutely keep you apprised of how we're doing throughout the process. We'll let you know what the progress looks like. They're all highly visible events. They're individual integration tasks that are easy to follow. And as we get the vehicle to the Cape, we'll be able to provide additional information about the process flow looks like at the Cape. And that's the real answer to the question. And then that's where we're at. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Um, my question is for Steve. Could you describe um, what sort of interactions you've had with the Biden administration? And if you've gotten any uh, indications of how things might be different in the NASA program, Artemis in particular, but anything else in, uh, in general that you could see shifting? Thank you. Yeah, so in, in general, we've gotten really good support from the Biden administration, um, pretty much across the board. Um, so um, I have to say I am, I am optimistic about the trajectory that we're on and, and, sort of, and pretty much staying on that trajectory. Now, with respect to Artemis, uh, I was really, really excited and, and, and glad to see early on the administration um, you know, uh, communicated their support for the goals and objectives of the Artemis program and our overall Moon to Mars strategy. And obviously, human exploration is the, uh, and human missions, human, human spaceflight missions are the most uh, complex and visible aspect of Artemis, but we also are conducting robotic missions um, to the Moon and to Mars. Uh, the the Mar robotic Mars missions are also part of planning of and advancing our goals and objectives for Moon to Mars as well as technology and demonstrating the technologies that are gonna allow us to stay on the moon sustainably and, and for the long term and uh, enable human missions to Mars. So I think the administration has really embraced our overall Artemis uh, strategy and goals and objectives and so far supported that, as well as highlighted other um, ways in which we contribute to important policy objectives for the new administration, including climate change, and that includes the research that we do with our satellite, satellites and, and instruments, um, reducing the environmental impact of aviation, uh, STEM engagement, um, that's really important. One of the important things we do is inspire the next generation and inspire our youth to go into science, technology, engineering, and math, and, uh, and, use, and, and using the power of diversity and inclusion um, to advance our goals and solve really the really tough problems that we have. So, um, so far, I am really excited about um, the support we've gotten from the Biden administration. Thank you. Our next question is from Phillips Loss of nasaspaceflight.com. Yeah, I think this is for uh, uh, Julie Bassler or John Shannon. Um, uh, it sounded like on the audio that, that you got the low-level cutoff test the, the LOX depletion test, but I just wanted to uh, check and see uh, that uh, confirm that you did. Um, and anything you can talk about in terms of the process from here to putting the stage on the barge. Thanks. Yeah. So this, uh, I'll take I'll take a part of that. Um, I am not familiar, uh, Philip, with any uh, low-level cutoff. Uh, uh, so he's, talk, he's talking about. We had the plan to do the low-level LOX cut at the end of the test today, and that went according to plan. Okay, okay, so yes, I, okay. So I'm looking yeah. for you to confirm that. Okay, yes, yes, we, we did meet that objective. Okay, now I'm, I'm with you, Philip. So, um, and as far as uh, finishing up uh, what we have left to do, so we'll be re doing our refurbishments, um, we'll be reviewing data, and then we'll do our break of configuration, 
And then we have uh, about mid-April is what we're targeting right now to do uh, shipping our um, core state over on the barge to uh, KSC. And so by the end of April, we're looking at arriving at KSC. And uh, John Shannon, I'll throw it over to you if you want to add anything to that. Uh, Julie, that was a great explanation. Um, Philip, from our initial look at all the data, we achieved all of the objectives, even our secondary objectives. We did see a LOX low-level cutoff. Um, and the system behaved exactly as it should. And um, so we're very excited about the, uh, the data that we've gotten. It's terabytes, and we'll, we'll be working through that uh, over the next couple of weeks as we do very detailed uh, inspections of the hardware. Uh, but the initial look is that uh, everything uh, worked perfectly. And we also can't forget to say that it wasn't just the vehicle that worked perfectly today, it was the B2 test stand. And the work that the Stennis Space Center did to pull off an amazing test like this was unbelievable, and all of their systems just worked exactly like they should. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Uh, congratulations, everyone. Uh, looked great today. Um, the, the engine fire, the cork insulation fire, it seemed like that was expected. Um, because of the hot exhaust on, in the test stand, and, and I think some of that was planned for. Can someone, maybe John Honeycutt or, or, or John Shannon, talk about kind of what we saw there on the, the screen and, and why that probably wouldn't be an issue in flight when you're in a different environment? Thank you. Yeah, Eric, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I know a little bit about it. I'm not a, a thermal expert by any means, but, uh, you know, after the first test, uh, we, we saw some base heating data that, that made us uh, look at the amount of cork insulation that we had uh, on the, in the boat tail area of the engine section. Uh, the team went off and, and made a decision, number one, to go ahead and remove those, uh, those uh, rain covers that were on the, the engine blankets, uh, and, and we saw those uh, burn off in the in the previous test. Number two was to add some cork insulation and some uh, of the reflective tape, and uh, we we did that. Uh, I would guess had something on the order of uh, probably four or five inches of cork in layers applied with adhesive. So what you saw there was some of the tape burning off as well as uh, once one of the layers of cork uh, got ablated, then the, you'd see the, we'd see the adhesive burn. Uh, we don't expect to see that during flight um, just due to the environments are different and you don't, you, you don't, they won't, they, the aft end of the vehicle won't experience uh, that same uh, radiative, radiative heat load. Well, Mr. Shannon or Julie, if I missed anything there, you guys can chime in. Yeah, I think you covered it exactly correctly, Mr. Hunnigan. Uh, John Shannon, do you have anything to add? I, I would just add one thing. While it looked uh, kind of interesting, uh, two points. One is we have temperature sensors underneath that cork, mm -hmm. and none of those sensors got above 100 degrees, so we were in great shape. The cork did its job. Um, and as John said, after two minutes of flight, we're out of the sensible atmosphere and you wouldn't have any burning like that. So you guys got it exactly right. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Just wanted to ask uh, about the uh, the gimbal profile, I know the gimbal profile towards the end of the burn you did, uh, uh, you know, sort of stress the system um, with, I think, low uh, pressure in the hydraulic system as the fuel tanks or propellant tanks were, were getting lower. Uh, how did that perform compared to, to expectations? And also, have you noticed any damage to any of the, the foam insulation? Uh, have you had a chance to look at that to see what might, be, might have to be touched up uh, after shipment? Thanks. So yes, um, the gimbling that we did and all the actually ramp up and down of the engine, engine th throttling all matched exactly what we predicted. 
Um, so right now, you know, the, the team will go through and look at all that data, um, but we saw nothing anomalous there, so it, um, it looked really smooth. Um, and um, from the, um, the, the data that we do have, you know, we're going to have to go through that uh, more thoroughly, um, but it is looking uh, like we have uh, a very uh, strong TVC system, and, uh, and we hit all the ends of the boundaries. You know, we were testing the limits there to make sure that we could fly through any kind of environment. And since this is a generational vehicle, um, it's something we wanted to test for all future uh, core stages and in Artemis missions also. And, uh, and could you repeat the second question again? Actually, Stephen, uh, he, um, he's, he, we've closed his mic. So Stephen, if you have your second question, you can rejoin the queue, just press star one. All right, our next question is from Will Robinson-Smith from WAAY-TV. Hey, everyone. Congratulations on the test today. I was curious, since the, the goal, of course, was initially to reach the four-minute mark, with the ideal being the eight-minute, can you talk about what some of the important data that was gathered during that four-minute interval beyond the four-minute threshold? Thank you. So I'll address that, and then I'll turn it over to John Shannon, too. Um, really what we were looking for to get uh, past the four-minute mark was um, some of our secondary objectives, and that was the frequency re response test. That was the gimbling test that we did, and also looking at when we throttled the engines um, uh, up and down that we could withstand those different loads. Uh, John Shannon, do you want to add anything to that one? I'd just say that we collected a lot of data uh, today um, being able to see the hydraulic system work with very little propellant in the uh, in the tanks with some aggressive gimbling was a real stress test for the vehicle, and it just gives us great confidence that uh, the vehicle, as designed, can handle uh, exactly what it was designed for. The, the vehicle really performed like a champ today. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Jake Robbins of We Martians, and then we'll go to Stephen Clark. Hey there. Uh, congratulations on your test today. It's really great to see. Um, I know you're not going to be green running another SLS core stage, but I think you will be doing one for the exploration upper stage. And my question is, are there any lessons that you learned from this test today that you want to take forward to the EUS? Yeah, uh, there's definitely lessons learned there. I think... Uh, We've learned how to work together as a team and, and integrate uh, the flight hardware into the test stand. Uh, the team's much better in much better shape just to understanding how the stand operates. Um, we've got some we've got some lessons that we learned uh, relative to uh, the things that we th need to do relative to um, how we integrate the EUS into the B1 stand. So uh, I think we've got an opportunity to take our lessons learned and uh, really take advantage of the next green run test with, that we do on the exploration upper stage. All right, thank you. And we'll go back to Stephen Clark of Spaceflight Now. Thanks, Stephen Clark, uh, Space Flight Now. Just wanted to see if, if you've had any chance to do any sort of inspections of the, uh, the foam or any of the insulation on the outside of the core stage since the, green, since the hot fire was completed. Um, any significant note, notes there on what may need to be touched up or repaired before flight? Thanks. Yeah, so we, we, did, we did notice a couple of places in the, in the inner tank area which is the structural piece in between the liquid oxygen tank and the liquid hydrogen tank. After uh, the, the tanking test and, and the first hot fire that we did, uh, we went and did some, we went and did some, uh, some pour type repairs to that TPS and we'll have, to, we'll have to do some more work to dress those up uh, either prior to shipping to KSC uh, or once it gets to KSC, there. Uh, I, I will say this: just overall, I, I'm super excited to how well the the TPS team performed over the last several years. They the, we went through a new 
a development process um, with new materials. And they just did an outstanding job, and, and the performance of the of the TPS has, has just been outstanding. We, uh, none of us expected that we would be in this good of shape uh, coming out of this test, so uh, I'm really happy. All right, thank you. Those are actually all the questions that we have, so we'll conclude the Q&A portion. Space Launch System is the only rocket that can send the Orion spacecraft, astronauts, and supplies safely beyond the moon in one launch. The next time these engines fire up, we'll be on the launch pad to send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft around the moon on a flight test for the Artemis One mission. To learn more about NASA's Artemis program, follow our progress at nasa.gov slash Artemis program.